for our other people who aren't here. So welcome to the ORCID API FAQs and trivia. Um, so I have the list of questions already. Like I said, if you have additional questions, um, please put those into the chat or add them to the end of the agenda document and we'll just go through and we'll see how far we can get. Now, some of the questions are, some of the initial questions are a little more lengthy because you have to kind of explain how everything works at first, uh, what everything is at first. So let's just jump in and see how this goes. So the first question is, what does the ORCID API, and for this, I am talking about the member ORCID API, what does it allow institutions to do? Does anybody want to take a stab at answering the question? And you can either type into the chat or unmute. Okay, I see one person in the chat, um, Alana. Um, track publications back to the institution. Um, that is one thing that the ORCID API allows institutions to do. Um, does, do you or does anybody else have additional things? I, I have kind of four things ultimately that the ORCID API allows institutions to do. So from my understanding, uh, you can read public data and you can read private data if the individual has given you uh, permission to do so, and you can write data also if the individual has given permission. Perfect, yes, that is correct. Um, I'll go ahead and put you, Clark, and Alana on the wheel of names. Everybody just bear with me. So just as an FYI, for a side note, if you ever need to do this, just go to wheelofnames.com. Um, and you can add people's names and then at the end we're going to spin. But let's continue with answering the question. So yes, and I have, I have this kind of explained out um, in the slides. So this is kind of a very generalized graphic, but basically you're thinking about your researchers and hopefully they all have ORCID IDs. And then organizations or institutions can basically use the ORCID API in systems. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a minute. But basically, you're using the ORCID API to connect with your researcher's ORCID um, ID. Um, and what this looks like in kind of a different format is organizations can use the API to read data from your researchers ORCID records. So having data go from the ORCID record into your organizational systems, and that can be um, public data. And in the member API, you can also read data that's set to trusted parties only. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And organizations can add data to people's ORCID records. Um, so any information fields that are in the ORCID record, Organizations can use the ORCID API to actually write that information to your researchers' ORCID records. And those are really the main basic things. Um, you can kind of think of the API, this is just a metaphor, um, as kind of, you know, different systems. And this doesn't even all have to be at the same institution, um, but different systems are often thought of like silos of information and the API kind of provides a crosswalk so that data can go, you know, across and between systems. Um, and so the ORCID API kind of provides that. Um, now, just kind of as an FYI, uh, ORCID does have a public API that is free and open and anyone can use. And then um, I believe everyone on this call is from an ORCID member organization or maybe you're at a prospective organization. So the member API allows you to do everything that the public API allows you to do with some additional things. So you're probably you know, most interested in what the member API allows you to do, which is to gather your researchers authenticated ORCID IDs. You can search for public data in ORCID. 
read public data from ORCID records, read limited visibility data from ORCID records, and also write data to ORCID records. Um, and everyone who's part of the ORCID US community is also a premium member. So an additional piece of functionality that you can enable with the ORCID API is something called webhooks which basically allows your system to get a notification anytime something on a researcher's ORCID record has changed. It'll just send a notification to your system saying that something on that ORCID record has changed. So that can be kind of a flag for you to pull in that new data. Any questions so far about this? All right. So in a kind of a different, uh, not a list format, just to kind of help your brain visualize what the member API allows institutions to do, so it really sinks in, gather those authenticated ORCID IDs that will really help to mitigate any confusion that's going on around people's names. Read data from ORCID, that's really helpful in terms of streamlining a data collection process for looking at individual activities and contributions, but also at the aggregate level, you can take that data from ORCID and look at programmatic or institutional impact. Writing data to ORCID records allows your institution to basically assert that you do have this relationship with your researchers, whether it's an employment relationship or an education relationship or what have you. You publish their paper, you gave them grant funding. It basically contributes to the metadata integrity of the whole research ecosystem that's using ORCID. And then the final piece, what I consider to be the fourth thing that the API allows institutions to do. It's really a combination of all three, but basically it's this idea of interoperability and saving time and reducing administrative burden. Because if you can have data stored in an ORCID record and then reuse that data across different systems, it really helps everybody so researchers aren't having to fill out forms over and over again and you're not having to constantly be tracking people down to get their CVs and that kind of thing. You can just connect through ORCID enter once, reuse often. Um, and when we're talking about reading and writing data to and from ORCID, just some examples of the types of data. If you're not, if you haven't looked at ORCID in a while, you're not super familiar, there's biographical information so people can have a biography, other names they've gone by, uh, websites, keywords related to the research, other IDs. Um, you can have an email address, though by default it's set to private, so people would have to go in and change that setting if they wanted people to see their email address. Of course, there's the employment section, so employment history, education and qualifications, um, invited positions and distinctions. This is kind of a new thing over the past couple years. Um, membership and service, so people can put committees that they're on, memberships they have, funding that somebody has received, and of course works. Um, I think that's kind of the most popular thing. Um, and then people can track their peer review activity, although this has to get written to their ORCID record through the API from the peer review organization. So people can't just add peer review to their own ORCID record. It has to get written by an organization. Same thing with a, uh, a new section called research resources. This is for labs or facilities or special equipment that somebody has used over the course of their research. So uh, this is an example from the Environmental Molecular Sciences Lab they are having people connect their ORCID ID when they come in to use their equipment and then they write that that equipment usage to the ORCID records. So those are all the different types of data that the API allows organizations to basically read and write uh, machine to machine without requiring uh, manual entry of information and, and transfer. Any questions about anything I just said? Um, Amaresh? Yeah, hi, uh, could you go back a couple of slides? I think it was slide seven, you know, we had the four quadrants. Oh yeah, the four quadrants. So okay. I had a question about the top yeah. left one. Um, so 
Yeah. So I'm at I'm at MSU. So it would be possible for us to using the the member API to get all of the uh, ORCID IDs of ind individuals associated with MSU. Is that is that what that means? Yeah. So that is possible. Um, what this really means. So an authenticated ORCID ID is an ORCID ID that your system grabbed using the API when the individual that owns that ORCID ID goes through the authentication process okay. within your system. So wherever you have the API integrated. So you can't just like go into your command line and just like grab all the ORCID IDs for MSU people. What you can do is integrate the API into a system that you're using and then ask all of the researchers at MSU to go and connect their ORCID ID with that system. And then the system will get their authenticated ORCID IDs when they do that. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. Any other questions? And I'll, I'll, I'll walk us through the authentication process in just a minute. It's kind of part of a bigger question around how does all of this actually work? Okay, if there are other questions, um, do feel free to raise your hand, type in chat, or unmute yourself and interrupt me. I'm totally fine with that. Um, okay, so the next question that I get a lot, um, and maybe you have been thinking this and maybe I've been too scared to ask, but what is a trusted party and what does it have to do with the ORCID API? Does anybody want to take a uh, guess or have the answer for this question? Anybody? I'm not seeing any movement, so I will. Sherry, can I? Oh, actually, I'm yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, no, um, a trusted party is someone a ORCID user gives authority to or permissions to view and or possibly add things to their ORCID record. And um, if, you are, if you are that trusted party, then you could use an API to do the updating um, and, and actually also searching and finding. Because um, as, as the um, for, for the MSU question, if the um, Michigan State people don't have things trusted to Michigan State, then you really can't find their IDs if you're looking. Right. Um, very great answer, Sherry. I'm putting you on the wheel of names. As you started answering, I saw that we had two, uh, two more, um, three more now answers. Um, so parties you've authorized to access your ORCID record, that is correct. Um, is it a party that can push data to the to the API? Uh, yes, basically, and I'll, I'll cover that. Um, and it is a setting that the ORCID ID holder has to set. It's more specific than public. That's correct. So all of these answers are actually correct. Um, so I'm going to add Christina um and bonnie and alana you're already on there um so yes yes to all of these um to get started more with answering this i'm going to go to my actual orchid record um so you probably already know and if you don't that's totally fine you're learning now that each section of the orchid record each piece of data when the user is logged in has this little control up here and that allows the user to set visibility settings. So the trusted party kind of has to do with these visibility settings because the, the settings are everyone, which means public on the web. Anyone can see this data and you can get it through the public API. Then there's private, which is literally no one can see this other than the person whose ORCID record it is. And then there's this trusted party setting to where it's not public on the web, it's not private either, only people and organizations that I designate as a trusted party are able to um, see that data, read that data, and it's possible to have trusted parties also add data to my ORCID record. 
Um, so for an organization to be a trusted party, the organization does need to have the ORCID API basically integrated into a system. Don't worry, I'll talk in detail about that in a minute, but you need to have the API integrated into one, of, one or more of your systems and the researcher would have needed to connect their authenticated ORCID ID with your API integration. That would designate your organization as a trusted party. For an individual to be a trusted party, um, that really doesn't involve the API. The API is really more for organizations looking to read and write data to and from their researchers' ORCID records. But you can designate an individual as a trusted party. So to do that, um, you go up to your menu when you're logged into ORCID and you go to account settings. Or, you know, you can do this um, and you can help your researchers do this if, if they have questions or, you know, need help with this. But in the account settings, first of all, in, there's a trusted organizations section. And this is where I can see all of the organizations that I have connected my ORCID ID with. So these are all trusted organizations for my ORCID record because I've connected my ORCID ID with all of these organizations and sites. It tells me when I made that connection. It tells me the type of permission I granted to that organization. And then these trash cans allow me to revoke that trusted connection if for whatever reason I don't want Scopus to be a trusted party on my ORCID record anymore, for example. Then you'll see this trusted individual section. So if I'm gonna designate somebody as a trusted individual on my ORCID record, they also have to have an ORCID ID. Um, I can search for people based on name, based on email address, or based on ORCID ID. Um, so I'm just searching for my colleague, Burnett Sherman, and you'll see that, you know, search results come up. So you'll want to click on the ORCID record to make sure it's the right person. Um, and then you can just add that person as a trusted individual. And then now when Burnett goes to log into her ORCID, uh, record, she'll be able to actually access my ORCID record. So I'm actually a trusted party on a few people's ORCID records. If you are a trusted individual, um, when you log into your ORCID record, you'll see that under your name here, there's a option to switch account. And if you click on that, um, you'll see that I'm a trusted party on two people's ORCID records. So I can go to one of them for example, and, uh, and it's basically like I'm logged in um, basically to this person's ORCID record. Uh, so I can go and add information um, to this person's ORCID record for them. So, but this is a much more kind of manual process, whereas organizations can be trusted parties and organizations use the API to do the reading and writing and adding of data, but it is also possible. So this is telling me that I'm now managing Sharla's record and I can actually go in and add information or you know, edit information on her ORCID record. Any questions about the trusted parties so far? Okay. Well, if questions come up, don't hesitate to speak up. All right, so the, our next question, this is kind of a big one, but uh, so there are a lot of potential pieces of right answers if people do want to give this a shot. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna spend the next several questions on exploring how the API works. This specific question can be, how does the API work in general? But Specifically, how does the API work in vendor systems versus custom systems, and, and does that make a difference? Does anybody want to give a try for answering this? I'll give you just a minute to see if anybody pipes up. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody flagging me down, so I'm going to go ahead and just dive in here. Bear with me. 
All right, so how does the ORCID API work? This is kind of a very extensive and complex question. Oh, I see we're getting some chats. Christina, I think you have to get a key that lasts 20 years. That is correct, partially. So good, good, uh, good try there. And I can I can put you into the wheel of names, but I'll have to distinguish between Christina Miski and Christina Chan Park. Um, anyone else have oops have a stab at a answer? I'm gonna do Christina M, and then I'm gonna do Christina C P. Okay. Okay. So how does the API work? It's very complex, but we're gonna dive in. The first thing that will that you need to make the API work is you need a client ID and a client secret. This is information that you will get from ORCID. Um, and uh, that process varies a little depending on whether you're using a vendor system or you're doing a custom integration. So basically, just remember that the first step that you need to make the API work and get started with it is you need a client ID and a client secret. All of the organizations that are members of the ORCID US community have access to five client IDs that each have a corresponding client secret. So you would use each of those client IDs and client secrets in a different system or a different integration. And so these are just some examples of what a client ID and a client secret look like. So anytime we say you need your ORCID API credentials, we're talking about the combination of the client ID and the client secret. Now, um, I'm really just gonna talk about the member API. It's a little bit of a different process if you're using the public API. And if you have questions about the public API, you can just add them to the end of our doc or put them in the chat and we'll get to them eventually. But um, for the member API, um, you do have to be, your organization has to be a, an ORCID member. And uh, I distinguish between vendor systems and custom systems because it's a little bit of a different process depending on whether you're using a vendor system or if you're doing your own custom integration. So if you're doing a custom integration, your first step will be to register for sandbox API credentials. Sandbox basically just means it's a development environment. It's not interacting with the live data that's in the ORCID registry. It's a testing environment. So you would get your sandbox API credentials by filling out a form that ORCID has online to request those sandbox API credentials to start your development. Um, and there are there's a lot of documentation for learning about how to get started, how to do that. So this is just kind of a, an FYI. I'll share these slides after so you'll have all of the links. If you're using, uh, so if you're doing your own custom integration, you do the sandbox credentials first, you do all of the, the, the development and testing, then when you're ready to go live with your integration, you then request production credentials to go live. And so ORCID will send you a new set of client ID and client secret that actually works with the live ORCID registry. If you're using a vendor system that has ORCID built in, so things like Pure, Digital Measures, Faculty 180, Symplectic Elements, um, those are vendor systems. They have already set up the integration. You just need to get your client ID and your client secret to plug into that vendor system to turn on the functionality. So you don't have to do the sandbox first when you're working with a vendor system. The vendor has already done that development and testing. So you, all you have to do is go to the ORCID site and request your production API credentials in the form that ORCID has available. They'll send you the client ID and the client secret and then you just pass that on to your vendor and they can turn that function, functionality on for you. Um, so that's really the, the first step and it's important to know that there is a different process depending on whether you're using a vendor system or you're doing your own custom integration. If you're using a vendor system that does not already have the ORCID API built in, we're a bit limited there because we really need the vendor to build that ORCID API functionality into their system. Um, 
you don't have as much control over a vendor system as you do over a homegrown system or something that's open sourced. So just know that. Um, now we can get into a little bit more of the depth of the details about how the member ORCID API works. And I'm gonna try to describe this to you in the most basic way. Um, the first thing that's, that I think we kind of already touched on, but it's just always good to reiterate when you're thinking about how the API works is, you know, your researchers have an ORCID ID and um, you want to be able to connect with their ORCID ID and the data that's in their ORCID record. You wanna be able to make that connection with your institutional systems. Um, that can be a lot of different types of systems. We'll cover that in a minute, but generally it's systems that your researchers are already interacting with. Um, so you want that to be a secure, trusted connection. Asking researchers to manually type in or copy and paste their ORCID ID and give their ORCID ID to you that way is really not a best practice. I recommend against it just because with manual entry, if you even get one of those numbers wrong, it's gonna be completely pointless. You need to know that you have the right number that belongs to the right person. So try to steer away from the manual entry of ORCID ID numbers. So don't ask researchers to manually enter that. So what we're gonna do instead, and this is the starting point for the API and getting that authenticated ORCID ID, is to configure your system or systems to gather those authenticated ORCID IDs using the API. So that's kind of the basis. Now, the researcher does have to grant permission in order for your institution to get their authenticated ORCID ID and do that reading and writing that we talked about. So the user actually has to give your organization permission. That permission is granted by the user by having them go through what we call OAuth. It's an authentication process that you're probably familiar with from other websites like Goodreads or other things that allow you to either sign in with Facebook or sign in with Amazon or sign in with Twitter. Any site that allows you to sign in using a different credential from a different site is basically using OAuth. It's just an authentication process that, that brings in permissions from a third party to allow an, an additional site to access that information. So you probably are already familiar with OAuth, you might not have known that, but that's basically what ORCID uses to get permission from um, users to use their ORCID data in a third party system. So here's just an example. There are a lot of sites that are already set up that have ORCID as a sign-in option. So just as an FYI, that if you use the ORCID sign-in option, you're using OAuth. So this OAuth process um, basically has four steps. The user has to be able to go to a user-facing website or portal, whatever you wanna call it. They have to have some sort of landing page that they can go to to either create their ORCID ID if they don't already have one and connect it to your system, or if they already have an ORCID ID, they just connect it to your system. So they, there has to be a user-facing web page for them to do that. Now, most of the time, um, if it's an institutional system, the user would typically log in with their institutional credentials to access that page or at some step in the workflow, they would be logging in with their institutional credentials to verify that they are actually affiliated with your organization. And I'll show a, a demonstration of all of this in just a minute. Then they log in to their ORCID record to verify their ORCID ID through the OAuth process. And at that point, they are presented with a screen that asks them to authorize certain permissions for your organization to have access to their ORCID record. And we call these permissions scopes. It's just a fancy way of saying permissions. Um, so let me kind of, um, uh, in terms of the scopes or the permissions, there are basically four that you can choose to ask your researchers for. You can ask them to just get their authenticated ORCID ID. You can ask them to read limited access information from their ORCID record. You can ask them to write data to their ORCID record. 
And you can also um, ask them to enable those automatic updates, which is, should just be notifications if something changes on their record. Um, ORCID does have information about these permissions online. Um, so each scope gives you an idea of what you can do if you use that scope um, in your integration. Um, and it's basically just the permissions that you're asking your researchers for. So again, there's Authenticate, which just allows to get the ORCID ID. And you can also read public data with any of these. Um, read Limited, that's if you want to just read information that is set to trusted parties on your researchers' ORCID records. The Activities Update allows you to update anything that's in that central column of the ORCID record. The person update allows you to update any of the biographical information. You could choose to just use read public. You don't necessarily have to because you can read public data by just getting the authenticate scope, but you could specifically tell your users, hey, we're just gonna read your public data. And then the webhook is what would allow your system to get notified anytime a change is made on that ORCID record. And these uh, scopes and API basically permissions correspond to those um, uh, functionalities that we looked at earlier. So to get that authenticated ORCID ID and mitigate the name confusion, authenticate scope covers that. To read and assess information from ORCID records, the read limited scope does that. To assert data to ORCID records, the two update scopes cover that. Um, and just as kind of an additional throw in here, webhooks can be used to reduce administrative burden because you're getting an update automatically when somebody's ORCID record is, is updated rather than asking them to report that uh, manually. So I'm gonna walk us through, uh, if, you, if you came to or watched the ORCID API webinar, this will be kind of a repeat for you, but I have found that Boston College just has a really good example and I have good screenshots of how all of this works. So this is just an example from Boston College. Um, this is their user facing web page or landing page where the user is going to initially learn about ORCID. So this is their ORCID LibGuide that has all this information. Um, but especially I wanna point out the how to register section. There is a link here. So they are pointing people to bc.edu slash ORCID to register for an ORCID and or connect it to your Boston College ID number. So this is the initial user facing page that we talked about where your researchers can go to initiate the process of connecting their ORCID ID with your API integration. So Boston College has integrated the ORCID API kind of in a custom way with their PeopleSoft database. They have kind of a separate database where they're pulling information from PeopleSoft and then adding information from ORCID that they're storing. So if we're a user, we're gonna click on this link. We're gonna be prompted to sign in using our Boston College credentials. So there's kind of a um, security wall to get to the next step, which is more about ORCID, why Boston College is asking for the ORCID ID, and then a button to create or connect your ORCID ID. So you, you've probably seen this. This is a really standard. Um, it's gonna look very similar in, in any integration that you see. There's gonna be some sort of button or prompt for the user to create or connect their ORCID ID. Now behind this button, just to give you a look behind the scenes so you can understand what's going on here, it's basically a link that's called an authorization URL. And in this authorization URL, that ORCID basically gives you the structure for you input your client ID. So we talked about how the client ID is one part of the credentials that you'll receive for the API. You'll input the scopes or the permissions that you want to ask your researchers for. So here we're asking for that read limited and the activities update permissions. And then um, last but not least, you'll put in a redirect URI and that's just where you want your researchers to be redirected to once they go through this connection process. So we click on that button, the user is prompted to either sign in to their ORCID record if they already have one or they can register for an ORCID ID if they don't have one yet. At which point this screen will pop up and this is a standard screen that all ORCID integrations have. 
it will show the person's name, their ORCID number, your institution name, and then the scopes that we used in that authorization URL, those will appear here. So basically the institution is asking for the following access to your ORCID record. We're asking to add or update the research activities and read your limited access information. This part will vary depending on what scopes were used in the authorization URL. Um, yeah, so just to reiterate that, we're seeing those same scopes reflected in this um, authorization screen. Okay, so the user will click authorize. Once that user clicks authorize, your system receives back this chunk of information that you see in the middle here. This chunk of information will need to be stored in some sort of secure database on your back end. So that is going to really vary depending on what system the integration has been made with. Um, but as an FYI, the information that you do get back, your system gets, once the user clicks authorize, you'll get the person's name as it appears on their ORCID record. You'll get their authenticated ORCID ID. So they did not have to type this in, the system grabbed it when they logged in. You'll get the scopes confirming these are the scopes that the person granted for your integration. And you'll get an access token, which if you're gonna be reading and writing data to and from ORCID, you will need this access token to, to do that. So just know this information all needs to be stored in some sort of secure database. Um, and something fun and interesting is that by default, when somebody grants these permissions, they last for 20 years by default. So unless that person revokes those permissions by clicking that little trash can, or if, if your organization revokes those permissions for some reason, um, unless that happens, you'll be able to have these permissions on this person's ORCID record for 20 years. That's really helpful for if you're working with like students and then they leave the organization, you want to keep up with them. That's really helpful. It's helpful for, you know, um, grant awards if you want to keep up with an awardee years after the grant or just see where faculty are going after they leave your institution or researchers in general or what have you. Now back to our Boston College example, once the researcher has gone through that authentication process, you can do a lot of stuff with that authenticated ORCID ID. What Boston College is doing is they are displaying that ORCID ID um, on the faculty profile pages, for example. And Boston College is also using the API to write employment and education affiliations to the ORCID records for the people that have connected their ORCID IDs. So you can see kind of what that looks like here. The source is appearing as Boston College, so it's very trustworthy. You know that, yes, this person, you know, was a student at Boston College, for example. I'm not going to go into details, um, but there are a lot of tutorials online for the specifics of how to read data from ORCID, how to write data from ORCID once your researchers have gone through this authentication process and you have their ORCID ID and their access token. Any questions at this point? Um, let's see, I'm just kind of so that's kind of the user facing. I mean, that how the API works is it's basically code infrastructure that needs to just be built into the systems that you're using. Um, so most people are using um, some sort of programming language within a software um, to set up the ORCID API in their systems. Um, you could also use uh, a command line, which if you don't know what a command line is, it's just kind of a, this little dashboard that looks like this that allows you to um, type in commands um, to do programming and that kind of thing. So if you have comfort with using command line, you can use the command line to do certain types of searches and things. There are instructions online for how to do that. There's also a tool called the Google OAuth Playground, which you can use to um, interact with the ORCID API. Um, and there's a tutorial online for how to do that too. So I think, yeah, I've got links to the different tutorials. So if you do wanna go more in depth with the specifics of how to set this up, how to do the reading and writing, um, 
you can look at these and also you can always let me know and we can talk more in depth about these. Whew, that was kind of a lot. <laughs> um, um, can you specify what programming language is used or is there a default? It's whatever programming language your software is using. Uh, lots of people use Ruby on Rails, Python. Um, I don't know all the different ones, but you can pretty much use any programming language when you're working with setting up the ORCID API and having that. It's just whatever language um, your software is built on, whatever language your developers use. Um, oh, and I'm just now seeing some more things from the chat. Um, from Christina, you have to get the key that lasts 20 years. So we talked about that, that access token, those permissions that last for 20 years. So that's right. Um, and then it, it calls something and then you get an XML or JSON or something. Yeah, that's right. So when you're doing the reading and writing, that data is transferred in either XML or JSON, depending on how you want to set that up. It's very, very configurable. ORCID, the ORCID API is really just a piece of infrastructure that is designed to be built in and configurable to all different systems that we're using across the research landscape. Um, and then Bonnie says, for vendor systems, you are restrained to sending and receiving the data type that the vendor allows. That is so true and so important because I showed you all the different types of data that can be stored in an ORCID record. Some vendor systems that have ORCID built in only allow for pulling some of that data in from ORCID. Some vendor systems allow you to write data to ORCID, but only some pieces. Not all vendor systems allow you to do both reading and writings. They only do some. So it's really important to make sure you know what the extent of the ORCID functionality that your vendor system can provide. And if you want to see more functionality from your vendor, you need to write to them, you need to tell them, you need to bother them and say, hey, we want to see more because they're looking to their customers for, for this feedback. So let me, uh, I don't know, did I already put Bonnie? I did, I put Bonnie in the list of names. Okay, good. And looking at time, I don't, I don't think we're going to get through all the questions, but we'll just keep going until like five minutes. Um, Okay, so here's the section where we are going to kind of go into more depth around how the ORCID API works with different types of systems. Um, does anybody want to think about or have insight or feedback on how the ORCID API in general works with current research information systems? So, so these types of um, vendor systems that do have ORCID built in. Does anybody want to talk specifically to how ORCID works with these types of systems? Sure, I can talk a little bit about that um, from some eclectic elements. Um, individuals can add their ORCID ID or uh, elements will go out and harvest um, uh, potential ORCID IDs that users can then claim and uh, if they have entered any publications into their ORCID record, elements will harvest only if there is an identifier, a unique identifier like a DOI, will harvest that, will then use cross-ref, for instance, um, to pull in the publication's metadata for that publication and then link it to the user's record as a claimed publication. Mm -hmm. And it, they also started um, built in a way of writing from elements to uh, ORCID. But the user that's has right. to authorize both. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I'm seeing some stuff in the chat. Um, uh, you can import your ORCID record info into Faculty 180. Um, that's Christina M. That is correct. Um, and also, Bonnie, uh, Bonnie, do you want to unmute and talk about Pure and ORCID? Um, sure, I can do that. It's, Great. of course, probably similar to um, 
what Clark was just saying. So with PURE, they have an integration currently just for research output, so your publication data um, for read and write back and forth. And the user can enter their ORCID ID into the system. We can enter it as administrators as well, but only the user or um, somebody that's trusted in both ORCID and in the PURE system can actually connect it. So I can get a list and I can add the ORCID IDs to people's records um, when we use it for like kind of a reporting mechanism, but in order to feed back and forth, it has to be um, connected and authenticated and only the user, like I don't have their passwords into ORCID. So if we had a trusted person who was both their delegate in PURE and their trusted person in ORCID, they would be able to make that authentication for them. But otherwise, you know, it's pretty much limited to the researcher providing that authentication. And once that's in place, um, we're doing both read and write where we can send records out and we can also receive records in. Records that come in are put into a holding sort of pen for us to go ahead and approve them before they're actually added on to records um, in the system. Usually they're already existing records that just get updated because um, we're a little bit ahead of, of where people usually are with their own personal ORCID. Um, information, but sometimes we are getting some new things in as well, and then they go into our regular approval queue to get a validated and approved by one of the administrators in our system before getting added. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and so Symplectic Elements and Pure right now are the only two, um, Chris, that allow both the pulling data in from ORCID and also writing data to ORCID. Um, Christina, do you want to just talk a little bit about Faculty 180? Sure. Hi. Um, so with Faculty 180, unfortunately, the integration is only one way. Um, not that we haven't let them know we wanted to go both ways. Um, but currently, our um, faculty members can go in, they do the create and connect to connect their ORCID account um to their faculty 180 account and then they click import and they can import education employment um, funding and scholarship into their faculty 180 for their annual achievement report um, and one of the features of that import is that once it's imported after the first time um, there is no duplication after that so once you've already imported you don't have to go and keep doing it but the first time you import, you do have to kind of see, compare it with what you already have there mm -hmm. to make sure you're not importing duplicate records. Um, and faculty can choose what they import. We don't have any other um, middle ground with that. Faculty just import whatever they want to import with the integration. Okay, cool, awesome. Thank you. Thanks all for sharing on those. Um, and digital measures is one that just pulls data in from ORCID and it's just publication information. So some of these uh, vendor research information systems are more limited than others in terms of what they can do with ORCID. So just know that. Um, but yes, in general, these systems are set up to do that authentication process that we talked about. Um, connecting that ORCID ID with the researcher's profile in the system and then um, pulling in data. I mean, theoretically, these systems could pull in all of the different types of data from the ORCID record. They are just set up right now to just pull some of the types of data. So there's a wide scope that they could be doing right now. Many of them are just focusing on things like works, maybe um, uh, funding and like education and employment information. Um, but works is a really big focus for these types of systems. Um, That said, um, in terms of, I mean, basically the API can work the same in all of the different types of systems, but thinking specifically about like grant application and reporting systems, does anybody have experience with that or want to talk about that? How does the ORCID API work with grant applications and reporting? Just gonna give you like two seconds to speak up. This is kind of a growing area right now. Um, 
Funders are increasingly looking at ORCID and using ORCID in their systems, gathering people's ORCID IDs to keep track of uh, awardees and alumni. Um, there's a system called Proposal Central that has the ORCID API built in already that really allows for pulling all information in um, from people's ORCID records to populate grant application forms. And then also when it comes time to do periodic reporting for grant reporting, um, the API can pull in new publications and other information from the ORCID record to help pre-populate those forms that people are being asked to fill out. Um, uh, Christina says again, I think you can use ORCID to populate your science CV for NIH and NSF grants. That is right. Um, so Science CV is already integrated with ORCID, so I have a tutorial video on it, and um, people can transfer their data directly from their ORCID record into Science CV, basically just by clicking a button rather than having to sit there and retype everything. NIH is requiring ORCID IDs for uh, certain types of grants, I think, as a lot of people already know, and I've been told that NIH is going to start writing grant award information to people's ORCID records in starting in 2021. They're like working on getting that up and running right now. Um, so ORCID can be used as a way to kind of pre-populate information, so pulling data in from, from ORCID records. And um, grant information can also be written to the ORCID record to create more of a trustworthy um, metadata around what grants people have received. Um, Christina says, you can use ORCID to search for grants and pivot also. Um, that's right. Um, so Christina, thank you. If you do have to leave because you have another meeting, go for it. Uh, I think it's time to spin the wheel of names because we only have about four minutes left. I will go ahead and schedule a follow-up to this so we can keep going because we do have a lot more questions, as you can see. Um, so we'll just pick up where we left off on the next call. And of course, if you can't make it to the next call, this will be recorded. Um, okay, I've got everybody in the wheel of names, so I'm now gonna spin and we'll find out who's gonna win a prize today. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, close. Could y'all hear the clapping? Mm. No, okay. It, it does like this clapping and shouting noise. Next time I'll share that. Okay, so it looks like Bonnie is our winner. So Bonnie, I will be Thank contacting you. you separately about getting your prize. But everyone on this call is a winner in my opinion and everyone who spoke up and answered questions, thank you so much. I hope this was helpful. I will send the recording out and I uh, just stand by for scheduling information for the next call so we can pick up, pick up where we left off. Um, so thanks again, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Don't forget thank you can you. always Thank you so much. You can always contact me um, if you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one to go more in-depth with any of this. Um, my email address is there. Uh, thanks for joining and I'll talk to you all later.